on this webinar. Um, so kind of the rules of engagement is that if uh, you know there are three cameras on for for two speakers and and I'm sorry but but me as well. Um, I know I have the face for the radio, but um, yeah, those are the rules, so we have to follow it. Um, and then um, if you can please put your mics on mute and then um, when you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat box and I will voice those. Um, and so the plan over the next um, uh, over the next uh, hour um, is um, uh, to discuss the, the big picture. And uh, so we have um, uh, probably the best people to, to talk about this topic uh, with us today. So it's my uh, great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Dr. Turushev and uh, Alexander Misukin. Um, and uh, it's uh, yet another webinar in this series of space talks that has been uh, organized uh, together by European uh, Business Angel Network, um, the space chapter of the European uh, Business Angel Network and the New Space Capital. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome Slava and Alexander because they are uh, distinguished um, uh, uh, professionals in, in, in their rel related fields, uh, but also they're very close friends. And, and it's a great pleasure uh, that at this time when we can't meet in person, we still can meet online. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so I'll just uh, uh, quickly introduce uh, two people uh, that, that we have. and. Um, uh, I will start with Alexander, who has uh, actually seen the, the Earth from space. And uh, Alexander has been um, uh, on the International Space Station twice. Um, he's been a um, uh, cosmonaut with the Russian cosmonaut Otrad uh, for um, um, many years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, he graduated from Kacha High Air Force Pilot School uh, in '98. Um, he continued uh, his training in the Armavir uh, Military Aviation Institute, uh, and uh, he was uh, he graduated from there with the um, gold medal as a pilot engineer. And from 2006, um, he um, uh, entered the cosmonaut um, uh, candidate list at Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, and uh, he flew on. Um, Soyuz uh, in 2013 and 2017. Uh, he has the uh, record for the longest Russian spacewalk and he uh, has the highest uh, military order of the Russian Federation, Hero of Russia, uh, which we, he received from the hands of, of President Putin. Alexander, it's great to have you with us. Um, and um, Slava Turushev, uh, also a, a very close friend and a, a person um, who knows, uh, you know, while Alexander has been to, to the um, International Space Station and uh, has first-hand experience of um, a human space flight, and, and Slava can answer the questions uh, about uh, deep space uh, and unmanned um, uh, space flights. Uh, Slava Turushev is currently with NASA Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech and he's been there since 1993. He was part of uh, pretty much every deep space mission uh, launched since, including Pioneer 10, 11, Voyager, Cassini, Galileo, New Horizons, Curiosity. And uh, he, um, he is uh, one of the top scientists in his field and um, he's been um, uh, working in the areas of high precision navigation, uh, laser ranging, optical metrology, remote sensing, um, as well as architecture and mission designs. Um, Slava uh, also graduated um, uh, from, uh, he graduated from Moscow State University and also from UCLA uh, Anderson uh, School of Management. And uh, it's great to have these two gentlemen with us um, today. And um, um, the, the, the aim of, of the webinars at large um, is um, I think we may just lost Bogdan. Yeah, I think so, Slava. Well, I guess the aim is to discuss uh, the big picture 
on uh, science and life in space. And so I think once we regain contact with Bogdan, uh, we will uh, resume. But uh, maybe in the meantime, um, Sasha, what 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 is like uh, to get uh, training and to get to space? Maybe you can tell us what uh, a person experiences through the training and uh, getting into into onto the launch pad. Uh, similarly to what uh, two astronauts will experience today. So Sasha, can you tell us the human uh, side of uh, flying to space? <laughs> so I... Then uh, back. back. Sorry. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure at which point you lost me. From the beginning, yeah, you introduced us and then you disappeared. And then I disappeared, yeah. So <laughs> I left the floor to you. Conveniently. <laughs> did a great job of, of just Picking up from you. <laughs> Perfect. You see, <laughs> that's what real friend does. He steps in. <laughs> I did ask Sasha about his uh, uh, experience of uh, training and getting into space. Maybe Sasha can uh, can go through that a little bit. Tell us what does it mean for a human being to go outside the Earth atmosphere. Oh, what does it mean for human being or for for myself? <laughs> for yourself, Sasha. For yourself as a human being. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it, it still it's uh, the most um, excited part of my life, I think, for myself. And uh, especially, uh, I had the goal to become a cosmonaut since I was 12 years old. And it was a plan for me to reach this um, to, to reach to reach the launch pad, the rocket, and to see our Earth from um, outside. But also, why I like uh, I, I love my job because I understand today that step by step to the rocket, to to the lift, to the rocket, uh, you have a lot of training, and with all this training, you you feel uh, like you changed, uh, you become, uh, I think, I hope that I become stronger and better. And uh, so uh, from the big picture for me, uh, this way, uh, this job help, helped me to grow as a human being. So in big picture, I'm very happy person to get, to got this job. Thank you. So, Bogdan, back to you. And, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Alexander, uh, for uh, we all, you often give advice as uh, as a motivational speaker to 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 people, you know, trying to better themselves step by step and and overcome the the difficulties. And uh, uh, f when you were going to the space second time, um, was it as difficult as the first time, or that previous experience of of going through this? Um, um, helped you to 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 do it second time, or was that a completely different experience? Uh, thank you, Bogdan, for this question. Um, of course, I uh, catch my uh, the, some ideas in my mind that the second flight uh, shouldn't be uh, more difficult than first one, but. Uh, the motivation for a second flight was uh, came to my mind very fast. Uh, second time I was a commander of uh, Soyuz, and I was an expedition commander on board of ISS. So it was much more responsibility for myself than in my first flight when I was a flight engineer. And uh, main focus of this flight of second flight for me was to to prove that uh, uh, that uh, I, I would say now that um, to become a good uh, commander for the crew and for the whole system because I was responsible for and uh, I would like to be to perform my job as uh, as good as I can, uh, and I think I did my best. 
So it was different exper uh, experience for my for myself. It was very interesting for me, and I happy that uh, it was not just the same. It was a new step for 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 me to do as a professional and as a person too. Thank you. And and you continue training now for for the continuous space missions. Um, is that right? Yeah, Bogdan. Yeah, it's true. And I hope um, someone some someone we will fly together. Uh, I really hope so. Yeah, and we should take Slava with us as well. <laughs> I love the idea. Uh, and Alexander, that was actually preempting my next question to you. In terms of the, so at the moment, the space flight is is for very well trained professionals. Of course, we have seen space tourists, um, but they still had to go through rigorous and lengthy training. Um, so, at which point you think that it will become possible? Um, for just a general public and just a, for a healthy person rather than you know highly trained um, both physically and, and uh, technically trained person to go to space are we um, 100 years away or are we, are we a couple of couple of years away or something in between mm -hmm. um, thank you for the, this question Bogdan I wouldn't uh, tell exact uh, line when it, it's, it becomes such easier how to fly on the airplane, but uh, definitely it goes uh, uh, easily and easily from one day, day to another. For example, uh, the tourists who made space flights to the ISS, uh, they had to study for that, to prepare uh, for one year or from one year to uh, six months they spent in gctc in russia for training only uh, next year in december of the next year there is one more flight on uh, russian rocket Soyuz for two tourists and one professional cosmonaut so for current plan uh, these tourists will spend for their training only three months. And uh, uh, I think that uh, step by step, we, it, gonna be, it should be, become cheaper and it should uh, spend uh, less time for preparation and uh, the medical uh, restriction should be wide. I, so me medical um, restriction will be easier to overcome. I mean, every normal person will be able to do that. And, uh, Alexander, as far as the training is concerned, so the, the, the part of training, uh, how much of that is technical? How much of that is, is, is physical? Uh, and, and again, so when we're thinking about the uh, commercialization of the space flight for human beings, both in terms of the commercial space flight and operations, commercial operations in space, but also as, as tourists are concerned, um, they would have to focus more on the technical, uh, on, you know, uh, acquiring some technical skills, or it's going to be more um, just being physically fit? Uh, good question, Bogdan. Uh, now I think it's uh, kind of both. It's, it have a list of technical requests. Uh, you have, you must uh, be able to uh, um, use your space suit, use pardon, toilet. You must be able to eat in space. You have to know what you have to do if something happened, depressurization, fire or something else. Uh, and also you have to be good uh, physical trained now. Uh, but I think that in the nearest years, uh, there will be different type of spacecraft. For example, if you travel by shuttle uh, in, in the in past, uh, there was much, uh, it was less um, medical, uh, restriction it was much more comfortable than flying exactly on the rocket and come back on the capsule we even have a joke with cosmonaut and astronaut that 
uh, flying by shuttle, it's like business class, and flying by Soyuz, it's like economic class. Uh, because when you fly just uh, like airplane, it goes smoother, the G loads less, it's much more com comfortable. So it means you don't need such a high level of physical preparation. And I hope in general, it will be easy. It, it will take um, less time for preparation, for, for physical train, for training, for technical training. And I hope that price will go down also. <laughs> sure. And, but to put that in perspective, I mean, three months training, uh, uh, well, that's how, how much you need for the uh, uh, you know, diving license. Um, so it, it, that, that training time really went down. Um, so uh, then, uh, in, in terms of the technical training, uh, sorry, in terms of the physical physical part, what is the what is the hardest uh, part of this of this physical training? And and um, uh, for for a normal person, we had that question from from Stefano. Um, and uh, if I can add to that, that uh, is that um, kind of experience during the training, so the, the physical part uh, during takeoff, during the time being in space in, in, um, uh, or in, at zero G force, uh, or uh, when you're returning to Earth? You know, uh, during all these years of preparation, Sometimes it was a moment when you feel like, ah, oh, it's hard, it's tough. But now when you take a look back, it looks like mm, it was not so tough, it was not so hard, uh, talking about physical training. And I wouldn't say that, oh, you know, there is a, um, some exercise you have to perform it 125 times per minute or something like that. But I think from physical point of view, the hardest uh, type of training is um, survival training. There are several types of survival tra training because as we are joking um, in space, or in our spacecraft, we have a button uh, which almost describes like, very. Uh, I want back home very much. As soon as you push this button, you is going to come back to the Earth. And... Um, it's very important to push this button at, at, in the right moment. In this case, you come back to that place where, is, um, where people will wait for you. But in theory, we can launch in, in a lot of places and in the sea as well. So you have to be able uh, to survive and uh, wait at least two and a half days when a rescue team will find you. So uh, for this type of training, um, for one training, I uh, lost for up to five kilos. It was different type of them. Uh, and they have a different uh, duration since um, from two and a half hours up to two and a half days. But, and uh, different activities, uh, very funny, but the result was, um, approximately the same about by five kilo um, your weight gone probably from physical point of view it was uh, pretty tough um so it's a slimming technique but not for everyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, alexander to finish on stefano's question so the second part of his question so which part of the body are the ones requiring mo most training oh somebody say that um, the best cosmonaut and astronaut is that one who uh, doesn't have uh, legs because in space you do everything by your hand and you actually don't need uh, legs but uh, i think that all astronauts and cosmonauts disagree with this point of view uh, at least we need legs to run on the treadmill and it's uh, at uh, only one way for today to keep your shape and your health uh, on the uh, the same level, staying for a long time in space. Um, but as as uh, everyone from us uh, 
couldn't say that this finger is less important for me than uh, this one. And for Cosmont and Astron, I think it's the same. You need to be harmonical. Uh, 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 you need to improve all your uh, physical qualities, uh, speed. Я не знаю, Богдан, как выносливость сказать. Endurance. 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 Uh, thank you. Uh, or, uh, or force, all this quali uh, quality feature you need to, to have on the pretty high level. Yeah. And uh, Alexander, I have tons of questions, but I, I can't um, abuse my position of a moderator. So I'm going to ask the questions that, that we have in the, um, in the group chat. Um, so the question from Fabrice is that, Alexander, what do you think about Virgin Galactic? No. Oh. I think it's a great company and they have great uh, project. Thank you, Slava. Uh, uh, Slava showed me this um, uh, project. I was able to touch their spacecraft and... Uh, uh, you actually sat on it. You, you went in. You, you've been in. <laughs> yeah. Next but, step is to fly. <laughs> exactly. I think it's a great um, uh, project and uh, from my point of view, it might be in next in, in next several years. It might be not only tourists' uh, sense of such suborbital flight. Um, in my mind, there is a, an idea that as soon as a solid fuel space engine uh, technology will um, become mo more advanced, uh, a little bit cheaper, and uh, a little, a little bit more reliable, it, we will use it, this type of um, suborbital spacecrafts for uh, logistic too. For now, we spend about 12 hours to travel from Moscow to Los Angeles. But as soon as we have such type of mixed of the rocket plan, if I can say so, right? We will able to spend one hour and a half and uh, to and uh, have possibility to see our friends on the other side of the earth. And you know, it's interesting that uh, the next question uh, that that was typed into the group chat before you answered, um, uh, you, b before you started talking about the um, uh, solid propellant um, uh, launches, um, that question came from Simon, uh, who works at uh, ESI, the company that develops the um, um, solid propellant uh, launches uh, at the moment. And so the, and the question from him was that, um, uh, so, uh, Alexander, I want to interact with you. What do you think is the biggest challenge of commercial and widespread um, crewed space flight? Uh, widespread? Yeah, widespread, um, широко признанный или широко используемый. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Simon, for your question. <clears throat> we already talked about it. Uh, uh, what is very uh, symbolical today at uh, launch of Crew Dragon of SpaceX, which gonna happen in several hours today. From my point of view, it's like uh, opening really next page of human being space flight history because almost uh, all uh, first part uh, almost all 60 years from the beginning uh, all space industry works for government uh, space agencies means for political and uh, science sense uh, most of all but since this launch when uh, it's completely um, uh, private rocket and private spacecraft, uh, we have uh, economical sense of space flight. And uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, that space tourism, of course, it's the first uh, uh, part of it. Because <clears throat> when people ask me, what was your the best impression of your two space flights. Uh, I don't need time to think because it's definitely 
space view of our home planet. And uh, for me, it wasn't during my first day in, uh, in space. Bogdan, we have time if I, I describe it. Absolutely, please. And, and we, we, it's, it's really good so that we have the you know, first part of, of, of our, our discussion, the human space flight. And, and then for the second part, uh, I'm, I'm going to um, drop the barrage of questions okay. in, on the Slava already. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first day, first day, my first day in space, um, uh, CDR commander Chris Hatfield uh, came up to me and said, Sasha, follow me, please. I have to show you something. Uh, we flew to the cupola. It's a small module uh, for Earth observation. Uh, it's enough room there for two people and there are seven big windows forwarded to the Earth. And we were stabilized, easily touched to Henry uh, Real. And it was first time in my life when I uncontrollable start started talk uh, talk out loud to myself i said i can't believe i'm here and chris who had his third flight at that time he keep going with these words uh, forwarded to himself i can't believe too definitely from my point of view uh, our home planet space view it's a thing it's object which uh, call people call must see and uh, that is why i think that space tourism will will uh, will be developed very well and very soon of course uh, uh, medicine uh, science uh, science uh, from a economical point of view i mean that private company will be able to perform uh, science and experiments which they would like to do in space much more easily and uh, the big idea about log logistic uh, um, space or suborbital logistic i already say i think it will become true too thank you so much and uh, alexander uh, so i think uh, it would be my final question from from the audience and i still have one from me i, I saved it to the last uh, and uh, okay we have two more questions from the audience uh, and uh, so we'll, uh, question from the audience on suborbital customers of virgin galactic and blue region so chuck is asking whether um, you think astronauts or cosmonauts of virgin galactic and blue region would be um real astronauts <laughs> oh let's take another example divers there are people who like do this for fun and there are people who do it for work but all of them astronauts and uh, divers right um it's really up the difference is really just um, in professional levels or in your probably knowledge and the skills but all of them divers so i uh, I'll be happy is if all people who make a uh, suborbital flight will uh, uh, call themselves like astronaut or cosmonaut. Why not? Great. Well, that's a great, now they have a great advocate on that. Uh, and uh, so then final, final question from the audience is from, from Daniel Biederman. Uh, with your views, uh, views from space and the work you did on the International Space Station, how can space activities help to solve the problems we have on Earth? Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, thank you for this question. Um, uh, there is actually two direction of uh, space exploration. Uh, some we trying to so solve some uh, problem for uh, some task for especially living uh, human in space. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to live in space, we need great uh, radiation uh, shield, uh, radiation protection. But, uh, and actually we do not have, we still do not have such uh, uh, protection now. Uh, so as soon as we will find the way how to protect, protect ourselves uh, from uh, 
radiation in space, I, I'm sure that we will um, we will find the um, sense to use this technology on the Earth too. Uh, one more um, problem, I would say, uh, from this direction, it's um, uh, the problem of losing of calcium from our bones. Uh, you know that uh, if you stay a lot of uh, uh, long time in space, in weightlessness, without any exercise, the, our body start losing calcium from bones and it's very um, dangerous uh, for our health. The same problem have some uh, old people on the ground. As soon as we uh, find the solution in space for this problem, it might help on the ground too. And it was one direction, just forwarded to space activities. Another is a uh, direction when we exactly make research for something which um, forwarded to science on the earth. And from this point of view, the best example for, from my um, opinion is 3D bioprinting. We started such type of experiment a couple years in space. And you know that uh, cells, bio cells living on the ground, they try to make a flat, uh, uh, flat construction because of uh, gravity. But in uh, uh, weightlessness, it's possible to make a 3D construction from bio cells. And it's also very interesting for science. Um, maybe, may, I, I think it's very, young science, but uh, science with a big and wild future. And maybe um, it will be very helpful for life people on the ground. Thank you. Alexander, thank you so much. So Alexander, actually we have more questions coming and, and uh, but uh, considering the time constraints, I would have to, to, to hold other questions and, and, and the ones that I have as well. Um, uh, so, uh, but what I encourage our audience to do is, um, uh, with your permission, Alexander, if people can can reach out um, to you uh, via your your Facebook page uh, and also on LinkedIn, um, uh, if it would be, if you don't mind, you know, for, for us to then share it with with our participants and if they can just you know write to you maybe directly and and ask some some other questions that they have on on your unique experience. Thank you, Bogdan, but it would be better to use uh, Facebook in this case because uh, link, LinkedIn will not work it will not work for Russia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then uh, we will share with our audience uh, your, your, your Facebook profile. Uh, Alexander, thank you so much. And that kind of builds into the second part is that well, once, once we conquer the, the um, near Earth uh, orbit, then after that, um, kind of what's beyond that, um, so deep space exploration. Um, Slava, what are the most um, uh, awaited um, events in the next um, three to 10 years in terms of the deep, deep space exploration? And um, how much of that is driven by the governments and how, how much of that can be driven by commercial space? Bogdan, thank you for the question. Um, re really, uh, we don't have to wait for the 10 years. Uh, in uh, this July, uh, uh, next rover will be launched to, to Mars. So uh, Perseverance rover was just assembled at the JPL and was flown to the Cape Kennedy on, uh, in, in April. So now it's being ready for the launch to, uh, to the Red Planet in July uh, this year. So despite the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, People at JPL had worked uh, on, on the mission uh, assembly and testing, and essentially the uh, spacecraft with the helicopter will be uh, delivered to Mars uh, on, the, on the flight uh, in February next year. So this is an excellent example of how we are looking for life in the universe. And the first step, a natural step to look for life is on Mars, because uh, this vehicle will carry a helicopter and that helicopter will be landed uh, together with, uh, with the rover, will stay on the rover for about two months, and then it will start its own journey on the red planet. And uh, so this, uh, the rover itself will be able to, to look for uh, prehistoric, I mean, 
previous bacterial life on, on Mars. So this is how we will be looking for signs of uh, possibility that the life existed on Mars. It will also be able to put some soil for the sample return to Earth. So with the next mission that will go to Mars um, in a few years, we will be able to bring some uh, samples of Martian soil back on Earth and study those uh, samples for the science of uh, geology, uh, current geology and the prehistoric life on, on, the, on the Red Planet. So um, this, uh, uh, this rover will be launched, as I said, in July. And that, uh, this is exciting because uh, next uh, activity, I think, uh, will be uh, devoted towards moon. And the moon is, uh, uh, a one, is a part of a large uh, project that NASA is conducting now, bringing the human beings uh, to Mars by the end of, uh, uh, in, in the very near future. Artemis uh, program, uh, Artemis program is uh, devoted to the lunar exploration. There will be some uh, uh, orbital station around the moon, hopefully uh, the, uh, toward the end of this decade and with human landing and possibly habitat on the south pole of the moon. And why south pole of the moon is important? Because we expect to see a significant water ice deposited on the south pole of the moon. And the water ice was deposited by comets. And the comets uh, de delivered that ice through the history of Earth and moon uh, interaction. We will learn about the, uh, the early part of evolution of the solar system. We will learn about life, uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of having life delivered to Earth by comets. And so uh, this will be a very exciting moment when uh, we will have a, a permanent presence on the moon. And that will be an international uh, program that is now uh, governed by, uh, by, gov uh, by the governments. But in reality, uh, many commercial companies are entering this, uh, this possibility. As you know, there are plenty of uh, companies recently were selected by NASA to step in and to deliver uh, lenders on, Mar on, on the moon, some, uh, so, uh, some technology for, uh, for the habitats, and the possibility of uh, ferrying uh, cargo and possibility of flying uh, humans to the moon. And so once we'll have a permanent presence on the moon, uh, possibly within 10, 15 years, that will be an exciting moment for not only governmental uh, program of space exploration, but for a lot of um, commercial companies, because NASA is relying primarily on, uh, on the private companies to deliver this important uh, uh, technology to the lunar surface. So uh, we should expect uh, a lot of interest in developments around lunar program that is then transferable to the flights to Mars, of course. Uh, looking for life in the universe, looking for life in the solar system, we will uh, look at uh, life uh, existing on uh, Europa. Europa is a satellite of Jupiter. And uh, Enceladus is a satellite of uh, uh, Saturn because we see uh, the evidence for water plumes on those icy, uh, icy worlds. So those icy worlds have uh, a significant amount of water. And there is a, a likelihood that uh, a current uh, bacterial life may exist on uh, those uh, two satellites, Europa and Enceladus. So this is very exciting because that will happen within the next, uh, I would say, 10, 15 years. We will have uh, more data on about uh, uh, life existing in the in the solar system, and so again, it is being done with the technology that is being developed not only in the in the governmental labs, but primarily in the in the in the space industry. Because as you're aware, we are now looking at the small and capable spacecraft, uh, very uh, important uh, sensor developments that are coming from commercial world. Because now the uh, the cameras in your cell phone, the cameras in your in your camera, are very capable of taking very interesting, important images high resolution images of uh, multiple phenomena. So we are now packing all these uh, miniaturized uh, components in the small spacecraft and deliver them to multiple places in the solar system. A good example for that was the flight of two, uh, two small sats called Marcos. The Marcos were flying to, uh, to Mars together with inside a lander. And inside, uh, when it was landing on the, on the, on the North Pole of, of Mars, released uh, two, uh, two uh, small, uh, small spacecraft, uh, Marcos, and Marcos were able, uh, Mark 1, and, uh, uh, and uh, it's a uh, uh, Mars communication orbiter. Uh, this is what uh, Marcos stands for. So these two small spacecraft were able to deliver uh, real-time data during the landing of, uh, the, uh, of uh, inside lander. Uh, the cost for those missions, uh, for, for two spacecraft, I think the first one cost about nine million, the second one, uh, only like three million. So the total project now, interplanetary project, is uh, about twelve million dollars, which is a very different uh, cost uh, uh, scale compared to previous missions. 
So this is a good example how, miniature, how, mini, how miniaturizing uh, technology and developing a very capable and able technology allows us to explore solar system. And so we are planning to release more of those uh, small spacecraft in the solar system. Uh, back to you, Bogdan. Yeah, so, so, Slava, well, so well, there are government driven space missions, uh, you know, deeper space exploration in terms of Moon, Mars, and then other uh, space objects. And so, for uh, commercial companies, uh, started playing a much bigger role than they did in the past, specifically with the Moon program, as, as, as you described. Uh, but the environment that we're in right now, so, um, uh, the impact of COVID on the economy and the economy on, on tax revenues and everything else kind of going. Um, um, uh, what will be the impact of the government programs? Are they going to be uh, you know, shut down, cut? Are they going to be delays? And what's the spillover into the commercial space, um, if there is any? In reality, we expect uh, the funding will just increase because uh, these uh, programs are very uh, useful to sustain the capabilities of uh, delivering very unique technology. So we expect that this program will stay and uh, they will stay in the, and they will provide the pool for uh, technologies from the private world, from the private companies. So I think this is a very good sign for the uh, industry, uh, for the commercial space industry, that working with government now will help to uh, for the companies to stand up through this pandemic, because the uh, impact of pandemics uh, are, are going to be very uh, bad for uh, for multiple industry. But uh, in terms of the uh, the programs that we are talking about, the lunar exploration and exploration of Mars and nearby and in, in the deep space, will pull uh, will will pull for technologies uh, delivered in the commercial world. So we do expect that uh, new sensors, cameras, uh, uh, antennas, uh, miniaturized spacecraft will be uh, important for the next step. So we don't expect this funding will diminish. And uh, in fact, it will probably just increase. Uh, so Alexander touched on very interesting points of uh, research in space and for example, you know, some, as, as Fabrice put it in, in his notebook, mind-blowing things like uh, uh, 3D bioprinting. Um, but, but that's kind of at the early stage, at the stage of the research and prototyping right now. When we're talking about the deep space exploration and the um, uh, participation of the commercial uh, companies um, in, in, in that deep space exploration, do you see many companies that are ready um, to, to provide that support to the government programs? Or is it the question of just you know, two, three big players that, that everyone is, is used to hearing, like, like Airbus, Lockheed, and, and uh, say Blue Region? I see many companies here in uh, uh, Southern California who are um, developing uh, plants and technology that uh, will uh, be uh, important for lunar exploration. And um, it's uh, those companies uh, uh, trying to plug in into governmental funding and essentially deliver technology that can enable the plans that NASA has. And as you are aware, NASA is now uh, in the in the in the phase where NASA would like to be a customer, procure services from uh, from private industry. And so NASA is setting objectives, and the companies come in and actually uh, uh, solve those objectives, uh, address those objectives. For example, communication from Mars. There is uh, several companies that would like to provide communication capability for future orbiters and uh, landers on Mars. So this is uh, where the government will be buying those communication services from, uh, from the small companies that will deliver orbiters. There, will be, uh, there are some companies who are, de who are developing uh, technology to uh, fly in the, in the near solar system uh, area where they will be delivering instruments to uh, asteroids, to the moon. And so uh, space as a service is becoming a very important uh, uh, offer in the private world. It is being just, it is in the very beginning. So we need to go through the pandemic. We need to actually uh, uh, see who will uh, keep uh, pushing with that. But uh, I can tell you that from the governmental side, from, from NASA standpoint, uh, the agency is looking for those companies who will be able to deliver. So therefore, there is a demand for this type of services. And uh, I'm, I see uh, many companies are talking about stepping into this area and actually fulfilling the, those objectives. So we, I think we are in a very interesting dynamics where private companies have the unique opportunity to develop the technology, to sell it for the, uh, for the federal programs, and then also deliver some other adjacent capabilities for the commercial world. 
And uh, Slava, ISS is a great example of the international effort and cooperation. As far as the uh, deep space exploration, um, uh, um, do companies and, and countries work together? So do we see cooperation between the space agencies? Um, how, how the deep space race looks like? Uh, the activities in deep space are very expensive. So uh, many, uh, many agencies are trying to develop those activities jointly. For example, when we talk about the lunar exploration, I think it will be international. So uh, there will be uh, many players, I believe. Uh, there will be uh, players from, uh, of course, uh, NASA, Roscosmos, ESA, will be joined together to deliver different elements of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, space station there, similar to what we have done with the International Space Station. So I think it's a very good, International Space Station is a very good example how countries can uh, cooperate in space. And I think the lunar exploration will be done in a similar manner. Going towards Mars, uh, uh, there, there are plenty of examples where uh, you know, uh, the rovers or landers on Mars will uh, get some technologies uh, developed. Uh, uh, so those rovers built by NASA, they will be uh, building some, bringing in some technologies developed in Europe. And there will be some European and Russian missions going towards uh, the Red Planet. So there will be more of that cooperation because we recognize that you know, it's a very expensive endeavor and so it will be easier to do this jointly and the missions that i'm working on there uh, there are plans for uh and the activities to engage uh not only uh you know uh, uh, uh traditional players but also to bring private industry so we're talking about private par uh, private public partnerships that will be uh enacted uh, to deliver capabilities for deep space and public-private partnership, international public-private partnerships. So that is something that is coming into the into the world because we recognize that it's an exciting endeavor to exp uh, to explore space, but it will be easier to do this jointly. Uh, Slava, and uh, in this case, say for European companies, for European um, uh, growth stage companies or startups, um, do you think the uh, large NASA programs that, that are being developed? Um, is, is this an area of opportunity for them um, or is this uh, more kind of a very distant opportunity? Absolutely, it is an opportunity right now because uh, I know I'm aware of several uh, companies already who are participating in the Martian exploration and different technologies relevant to astrophysics missions where we have uh, telescopes and sensors developed uh, uh, by, um, by, by several countries. And in the past, we had the multiple technologies flown on European missions. Uh, so if a European Space Agency develops a, a mission, and NASA will be playing part of it. So for example, the mission that will be uh, developed by European Space Agency called Laser Interferometer Space Antenna to detect gravitational waves. So the mission was pioneered by a uh, European Space Agency and NASA will be playing a significant part uh, in that mission and vice versa. There are plenty of examples where uh, European companies deliver critical capabilities for missions that NASA is developing. Slava, thank you very much for, for, for the answer. And uh, we have a question from Stefana um, and uh, the question to, to both speakers. Um, when we will have the next technology breakthrough uh, about rocket propulsion or any propulsion relating to deep space uh, missions? Uh, at the moment, the fuel volume weight um, needs uh, is a major problem, isn't it? Uh, well, maybe, I, uh, uh, yeah, let me jump on it. Um, chemical propulsion is very limited capabilities. Uh, so basically, if we were flying to, um, to uh, the outer, uh, outer uh, regions of the solar system, chemical propulsion is reliable, but it, it takes a lot of time to deliver uh, a spacecraft to Saturn or Neptune or going further. So we are now exploring solar sailing. And the solar sailing where you have uh, sails uh, uh, that are unfolded on the spacecraft and you dive in towards the sun and the sail material will allow you to survive through the solar heating. Once you're going through, uh, through the uh, solar perihelion, then you unfold your sail and you, you like you, you're sailing like you're sailing boat. But now the velocity is uh, amazingly high. We're talking about increase of velocity by 10 times compared to current records. So the record is now about uh, 12 kilometers a second. We're talking about 30 kilometers a second uh, delivered by the solar uh, sailing uh, spacecraft. In this case, again, we're flying a small spacecraft, about 50 to 100 kilograms, and reaching velocity of uh, 30 to 45 kilometers a second will allow you to get to uh, pretty much uh, uh, um, to uh, Saturn in about a year and a half. 
so it, which is a, a very fast velocity compared to anything else. And uh, so we will continue to rely on chemical propulsion in for deep space exploration, but solar sailing propulsion is rich in maturity. We have flown several missions uh, that are successfully have, that, that successfully demonstrated that solar sailing may be the way to go to explore uh, to explore outer solar system. And, and uh, I, so before we go, we go to Alexander with the same question, um, uh, look your view on the ion engine and, and the combination of ion engine with the um, um, uh, nuclear powered core. So kind of combination of the of those two. Uh, is, is ion engines are being uh, uh, used now. So basically, the, it's a, it's a robust technology allowing to de develop uh, micro thrusting on the spacecraft. So adjust attitude. So I think this is a very reliable technology for multiple uh, uh, applications. So when we fly a small spacecraft, a constellation of small spacecraft for station keeping purposes, the ion uh, the ion thrusters are very reliable. So they're cold gas ion thrusters, electric propulsion. There are plenty of uh, propulsion technologies that are being developed within commercial world that are very useful. So it's essentially for multiple purposes, when you build large aperture, where you have to keep uh, a very precision uh, formation flight. So iron propulsion is very, reliable to, is very reliable technology. So I think it's very good that uh, commercial uh, companies are stepping in and deliver these critical capabilities for, for, uh, for uh, exploring, uh, for space exploration. Uh, thank you. And uh, Alexander, um, if uh, we can ask your help with, with the same question. Uh, so what's, in your view, uh, the next uh, breakthrough technology um, on the um, rockets and uh, uh, maybe on, 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 on other technologies required for the space exploration? Uh, it's a really good question. And uh, Slav already mentioned uh, several next uh, propulsion technology but uh, it's not only propulsion is very important for deep space exploration anyway i think that uh, mars uh, march will be uh, we will reach it with that technology will which we already have but to to make a real a reliability level higher we definitely need not only technology of uh, propulsion, new technology of propulsion, we also need uh, technology of radiation protection, as I mentioned before. Uh, for example, I think you know that um, ISS is flying so low uh, that we have uh, most important protection from radiation. It's a magnetic field of Earth. But can you compare on ISS? Uh, the crew can live year, year and a half. If we are talking about station on the lunar orbit, crew will stay there only for 60 days, maybe 60 days. Uh, and uh, uh, it, we have to fly to this, uh, to this uh, deep gate, space gateway station uh, only when we don't have a very high level of so solar activities. Uh, which is good now we can predict solar activities but let's say that something going wrong and the solar activity will increasing uh, by accident or for something uh, it means that uh, life uh, for human being outside of magnetic field of earth uh, will be impossible so it's very critical technology, uh, the shield of uh, from uh, radiation. Also, what I would like to, um, to bring that when I start my uh, space uh, study, I think that uh, spacecraft, it's like uh, your own car. You have fuel, you can drive whatever you want, uh, but um, as I go deeper and deeper to the rocket science, I realized that spacecraft, it's more like balloon. It has very tight connection with the mission control center. And it doesn't live by itself. You cannot do everything what you want. There are a lot of connections and uh, uh, you really touch to the mission control center. As soon as you go to fly to the deep space, you have a new conception concept of your spacecraft 
it should be uh, able to work isolated, uh, just spacecraft and the crew without help of uh, mission control center. And for, for this moment, it's still uh, some technology with which uh, wait for us in the future. Alexander, thank you so much for the answer. And look, we, we hit the top of the hour. And so just wanted to quickly recap uh, some of the topics that we, we covered before uh, saying goodbyes to everyone. And um, so for in the first part of the hour, we were talking about the human space flight. And so Alexander uh, offered his insight and, and personal first-hand experience on that. And uh, we discussed suborbital flight, where Alexander thinks that uh, you know we, we, it is going to happen very fast, and not only for the tourists, but also potentially for the um, cargo um, shipments, especially as uh, solid rocket fuels become available. Um, he also mentioned that um, getting prepared for, for, for the space flight is, is a fantastic sleeping technique, but not for the faint-hearted. And um, he um, described his personal experience of, of uh, seeing our Earth um, from space as, as not flat, uh, but definitely round and, and very small. Um, and uh, in terms of the interesting technologies that are coming out of space um, that would have applications for, for, for Earth, um, uh, you, you mentioned, but a uh, few um, 3D printing, then researching uh, on, on calcium, um, and also research on material science and specifically around um, uh, radiation protection. Um, and as we moved on to the second part of the hour, and um, uh, we talked about the deep space missions, I think uh, sort of a critical um, uh, critical point from from you was that um, we do expect commercial companies to participate uh, in the deep space exploration. And in terms of the funding from the for deep space exploration, uh, it it is here to stay despite the environment and most likely to increase. And there is also an opportunity for European companies to participate in the missions, um, both in the U.S. and in other countries, um, uh, due to the, the, the cost and complexity of, of those missions. Um, and gentlemen, look, thank you so much for sharing your insight. I really appreciate that. And um, before we, we leave, I um, just wanted to ask that, um, Alexander, so look, now for a um, couple of hours, probably a lot of things going on in the, in the minds of, of the people that, that are gonna take off, the, 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 the astronauts are gonna take off um, on the, the Dragon crew. Um, what are your wishes for them? Oh, of course I wish them good luck and a smooth job. I, will, I hope they will enjoy this flight. Fingers crossed, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks a lot for everyone to, to, you know, for, for joining us and um, stay, uh, stay tuned for, for other webinars. And uh, Slava, Alexander, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.